We're back again, flourishing, overflowing, expectant. I'm going to preach the Word because the Word will make you a free person. If you know the truth, the truth will make you a free person. And so today is the third uh, message in a series over the last two weeks and now today on just God's got you covered. God's bigger than anything that comes into your world because He's not confined to the speck of dust called creation. He's bigger than all that. We saw that in the first message. In the second one, we saw that God is big enough to, before time began, order your steps. So every step in your life is part of a God plan. You can get out off, you can get off the plan of God and you wander your own way, but He'll bring you back if you'll be open to Him. Well, this this week, I want to also try and encourage and convince you that God has prepared before time began your provision. It's one thing to know God's got it all, He could do anything. But did He actually think about you, which we know He did, before time and creation began, and He prepared a pathway for you to walk, a super highway if we live by faith. But He also stored up every provision you need for every need. This, uh, this is not how many people live. And so everything you will ever need on your journey is already preve- prepared to be provided by God. So here's the first thing. I've got a number of things God has already prepared for you and I that the Bible says. God has already prepared a feast table for you in times of trouble. He's prepared a feast table for you. It says this in Psalm 23 verse 5. God has prepared a table before you, laid out before you in the presence of your enemies. I love this. So in times of trouble and conflict, you don't have to get embroiled in the battle. God says, come and sit at my table while I deal with your enemies. And I always thought this meant, well, I got to make a choice by faith to go and sit down at the table of the Lord and sort of my enemies are all around watching, wanting to get it on. And I can sit at the table of the Lord and give them a, ah, 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 you know, up your nose with a rubber hose or whatever people shout out in a derive. But that's not quite what it means to come to the table of the Lord when you're in trouble. And I just, I, you, firstly, you got to choose, are you going to feast or are you going to fight? Huge. God doesn't say, you know, I, I'll give you yeah, that, that oomph to go and give him a good punch and take him out. He says, no, I prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies and conflicts. There's a higher law at work here to overcome the works of the enemy. And uh, the Bible's saying it's better to sit down with your enemy and chew the fat, smoke the peace pipe. It's better to sit down and uh, engage your enemy then stand up and spit out bones and curses at them. Chew the fat or spew the the curse. And and I saw something here. God's actually set this table up, not for me to be a spoiled brat and feast uh, while my enemies look on. That may well be the case, but I think the higher purpose is for you to invite your enemies to come to the table of the Lord. The feast table. There's a story in the Old Testament. I'm not sure exactly. It's just, I'm thinking of it now where David, after he became king, he said, are there any people left of Saul's household and Jonathan's? Uh, I want to look after them and honour them. Saul was the enemy of David. and You know, God dealt with all of those. But he found this young guy called Mephibosheth. And uh, when he was a kid, Mephibosheth, Uh, There was trouble in the camp and everything going on. And the nurse of Mephibosheth as a baby grabbed the baby and ran out and fled. 
and she dropped the baby and he fell and broke his legs and they didn't have the means or whatever else. And so he grew up a cripple. And here's this guy, Mephibosheth. He's got the curse of being part of the household that were enemies to David. And he's crippled and really out of the way of ever doing anything in life. And God said, bring him. Uh, David said, bring Mephibosheth. And uh, he's going to sit at my feast table from now on. And we will feed and he will be one of my honoured guests every time we sit to eat meals together. And the brilliant thing about this that I love is that Mephibosheth sat at David's feast table, the table of the Lord, and the table covered the deficiencies of his crippled legs under the table. We can get so head up about people's flaws, failings, and their, their, you know, uh, uh, descendant from what family and all that stuff. And here David says, no, you bring him to my table. We'll cover all that stuff with love. And he can feast at the same table that God's blessing up with. I, I think this meaning is more important than any other meaning that can be preached on this verse. But God has prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies, in the daily troubles and skirmishes where we want to get in there and fight and, you know, prove our point and et cetera, et cetera. And we, we never really achieve much except about causing a middle wall of division between us and them. Well, they're the enemy and we're the righteous and they're people that are crippled. They're not like me and we're different and we don't agree. And all you do is build a middle wall of petition. Well, the Bible says that the blood of Jesus pulls down the middle wall of petition between us. That's why I think it's as much about the table of the Lord, the communion table, getting things right between you and your family and, and that you've made enemies and you're standing on your little digs and, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm trying to live right, but you, you're, you're a crippled little whatever. And God says, no, poor, you sit at the table, invite them to come to the table of the Lord. Who have you excluded from your life? But God says, no, you bring them back to the table of the Lord together. Forgiveness, cleansing, overcoming, hide their flaws under the table and rejoice and feast and fellowship together. God's prepared that for you, but you've got to be prepared to sit at that table and not stand on your digs and strut your little self-righteous strut. I'm right, they're wrong. Hear what I'm saying? God sorted this all out before time began. He knew that you'd be a self-righteous so-and-so. He knew that they'd be a dumb idiot and the two don't get along. But that's why He said, I'm going to prepare this mercy seat, this table of the Lord, and uh, you can feast on the fullness of Christ, but bring your enemies. Get them to sit down with you. You'll be amazed how it changes your life and it's all prepared for you if you'll engage the supernatural provision for your life. The second thing, so that's the first one, a table in times of trouble. The second thing that the Bible teaches us is that God has prepared supernatural provision for me personally, for you personally. It's not just about His house. We'll get to that in a minute. But God has prepared stuff for you to flourish in life. There's a story in 1 Kings 17, 2-6. It's about Elijah. God tells him, prophesy no rain, famine for three years. Three years. And then God says, now go and camp. You go and camp by the brook Cherith. I've got a little brook there that you'll be kept uh, alive and well. And it's a bubbling little brook. And uh, he says, while you're there, I'm going to arrange and have arranged supernatural provision to kick in. God says, I've commanded the ravens, the birds of the air, to bring bread and meat morning and evening for you to eat. I'm going to give you miracle food from above. Now, when did this happen? On the day that He pronounced the famine or before time began? God, God had a flock of ravens that were trained for this specific task. I don't know who was trying, maybe angels trained them and how to pick up bread. 
loaf of bread out of someone's shopping basket and uh, some meat, fresh meat, you know, I fill it and uh, bring it. Uh, so I've heard preachers preach on this saying, well, the ravens just bought roadkill uh, to, and dropped it. No, no, God's not into roadkill. God's not into maggot infested meat. God's not into mouldy bread. You hear me? Every morning and every evening, these ravens had been trained to be God's messengers. What well, these miracles are phenomenal. They're not stories, they're miracles. And God had it all programmed into history. A super flock of ravens would be born. They'd learn, I don't know, they just learned. They knew how to do this stuff and bring and drop provision every day. I've had to learn over the years because I've pioneered a lot of churches, had to live without an income. And um, we're pioneering a new church now. And I don't receive any income from that church because God's told me, you've learned how to live by faith. Uh, you can put other people on the team as you grow, etc. And so I don't receive anything from the church. And so I have to apply this. God has already prepared for this season for me, supernatural provision. And so God led me a few years ago to start a thing called a thousand shields where I just mentor people with a prophetic edge on their life and share things with them because they're of similar spirit that I wouldn't share publicly or on social media where every idiot wants to pull apart every word. So I mentor people in the things of God and uh, it's called a thousand shields. And from that, they pay a little bit of uh, seed into our ministry every month. And from that, that's our income. And the truth is some churches buy into that and say, Steve, we believe in what you do. We'll support you too. And I thank God for that. And then sometimes after a year or two or whatever, some of those little streams dry up. And uh, all of a sudden I've got to realise, God, I need some birds of the air. And the funny thing is every time it happens, this stream drives up, another stream begins to flow another flock of ravens comes with fresh bread and rich meat and drops it into our lap. And it's the most exciting way to live. Did it come easy? No, we've been through some hard times and challenging times financially and uh, all that stuff. But God ever always brings us back because I dare to believe He's already prepared this stuff for me. Before time began, he's not taken by surprise. Even when I make stupid mistakes and investments and lose the lot, he's already covered that. I love this. I love this. You got to prove God in your life. He's well able. A thousand shields. What about another story in the Bible? I love this one. It's Matthew 17 27. Here's God about to meet the needs of uh, His disciples through Jesus. And uh, He's actually pre-programmed a fish. He's got a fish programmed. It's all locked into the creation's DNA. And uh, some people said, why don't you and your disciples pay taxes? And Jesus said, well, don't really need to, but because of these people, we're going to do it anyway. And he said to his disciples, go down and cast a hook into the sea. And the first fish you catch will have a gold coin in its mouth. The first one comes up. Check its mouth. It'll have a gold. Now my, the whole thing about this is if you could see behind the scenes in creation, here's this fish that somehow swallowed a coin that's got stuck in its mouth. And then all of a sudden, beep, 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 this pre-programming of creation goes off and this fish knows it's got to get, there's, a, there's a, a shiny hook over there with nothing on it. I've got to go and latch onto that. And he bolts through the whole, whatever they call it, not a flock of fish. Hey, I forget what they call them. Anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm not even going to try and work it out, but there's this whole school, ha, of fish, and this fish with the gold is, get out of my road, that's my hook. Where'd that come from? 
It was pre-programmed by a God that knows your every need. It didn't happen with God saying, heavens, I've got to get something sorted here. No, it was already planned for you. If you can get this point, God has got you covered in your provision. And so this, this fish with this gold coin, how did it get the hook in its mouth when it's got a gold coin there? All these things are miracles. It just grabbed that thing and said, I'm not letting go. And up it comes and a gold coin becomes a miracle for you. Sometimes, listen, sometimes you have to go bare, bare hook fishing. Just throw a hook in. Sometimes you don't need bait on it because God's already pre-programmed the answer. Somebody's got it for you. And it's coming because you dare to believe by faith. God has already prepared my provision for me and my household. Can you say amen? Ha, another one. Let's go further. Not only for you and your household, but God has already prepared provision for your ministry, the things you want to do for God. And a great story in the Bible where Jesus has got this huge crowd. They've all sat down. They're all hungry. They're all starting to, you know, we want food. They're getting a bit aggro. And uh, the disciples say, we can't buy anything. We haven't got enough money and shops a long way away. What are we going to do? Jesus said, go and find anything you can in the crowd. And they come back with a lunchbox of two fish that have gone off in the midday heat, five loaves and two fishes. It's not the best representation that's going to do a great miracle. This little boy with five loaves and two fishes represents, and I'm talking now about leading a church or, you know, funding a ministry or building something for God in your life and through your life. God always has people that have a lunchbox ministry. They may not be the guy driving the best car and the biggest big shot in town. They may be someone with a lunchbox and they bring it because they, Pastor Steve, I just feel God, God wants us to give you this gift. Maybe whatever. And you take it with a sense of privilege and honour because you understand the lunchbox ministry that God brings people into your world with lunchboxes. Nothing's brilliant about it, but you have to take it with a sense of humility and then you bless it and then you break it. And before you know it, It's fed 5,000 people and there's 12 basketfuls left over from a lunchbox ministry. Because what happens is when you receive one lunchbox, and it didn't happen here, that was sufficient to to do the whole miracle. But when people see one lunchbox, man, I had someone come up to me recently and say, and we just started our new little church. And they said, Pastor Steve, you mentioned a a video camera um, and uh, we got $5,000 to give to you to get our first camera. And I said, that's exactly what we need just to start and practice this whole video thing as our church grows. And then, of course, other people hear about that and say, what else? Lunchboxes, release lunchboxes. Never, ever despise what God does in your life. You see, If you'll handle the lunchbox well with faith, God will send others with treasure chests according to how you handled the lunchbox. You broke it and shared it and sowed it and gave it and rejoiced in it. There's been many times in our ministry we've had people bring their holiday money. Well, we're saving for a holiday overseas. And so we've got these thousands. We want to sow it right now because it's important into God's work. Then uh, because you do the journey, a year or two later, they go on that trip and it was far, far better because they sowed at the right time. God sends others uh, with all kinds of things. We're going to buy a new car. It's not the time. We'll get it later. We want to sow. We're out here with a need. And uh, house reno money. I've had so many people. It's just phenomenal. And how you treat the lunchbox will determine 
how big the treasure chest is that comes next and next and next. Never ever get over the lunchbox ministry in your church, your meeting place, the people that join you in your ministry. They're the bread and butter of life. Amen. The next thing, I want you to get this one. These are things that are already prepared. You don't never have to beg for money. Always prevent vision in, in your life and live with a dream and a vision. And God has it all. He knows what's in your heart because He put it there. He'll give you the desire. He put them there and He's prepared the provision for those things in whatever the season may be. The next one that God's prepared for you and I already, He's prepared a dwelling place for you, a home for His presence. And I want you to get this both for your own home and for the house of the Lord. Let me read uh, a Scripture uh, from John 14, 1 to 3. Jesus talking, He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have been honest and told you. But I now go to prepare one of those mansions for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I've got it ready. It's already prepared for eternity. And so this is important. If God's planted you, He's prepared a house for you. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10 and 11. Listen to this Scripture. So shall it be, when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build and houses full of all good things. I'm going to give them to you. I've already prepared them. I had other people build them and stock them, which you did not fill, hewn out and dug wells, which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees flourishing that you did not plant. I've prepared them for you. I've tried to live by this principle in my life, both for our personal houses and for the house of the Lord. And uh, every time we've planted a church, pioneered a few, uh, God has always given us a miracle house. The funny thing is, you know, some of these buildings that we've have become ours, when I first started the church, they weren't even built. And so as we began to build a, a crew, a company of people, all of a sudden we realised there's a university innovation centre being built over the road and it's massive. And God says, go for that. I'm building it for you. And uh, for about six months, they simply said, no, we don't want a church. You're not going to have it Sundays. We're certainly not going to give it to you all day Sunday. You're not having it. And so we just had to keep going back because uh, uh, when they say no, remember this. When God says yes, it's not a fight. It's prepared for you. And God spoke to me about that. The Innovation Centre of the university. I've said yes. And so we just kept going back. Every number of weeks, hey, we want to apply again. I know you've said no, but we, we believe it can suit our purposes uh, very. And finally they said, all right, we'll give it to you, etc." Uh, they had to give up because no one else would touch it and uh, uh, on the weekends. And so we, they needed our income, etc. And it became a brilliant place for us to launch our church into another whole stratosphere. And in the end, uh, we worked so well with them that they allowed us to hang all of our media stuff, all of our sound and video technology, etc. in the university hall. And anytime they had a big function, they used our media team uh, to engage and fulfil the obligation to provide all that and get paid for it. It was phenomenal. And God was so good to us. Listen to me. Don't, God doesn't provide backyard tin sheds. He does, that, that, you know, you got to get this. God has prepared something. We're right now in our little uh, pioneer church we've started is growing quickly. Uh, the only place we've found, we're outgrowing 
every week now. And so it's become a real issue and we're looking for the next place. And we've been to, you know, many different gathering places, some churches and other institutions said, can we use, share with you? And we're just getting no, no, no on every hand. I tell our church a no means there's something better. A no means it's something being built. A no means it's not fitted out properly yet. And so we continue to look and believe. But when God says yes, it means it's not a fight. It's still being prepared for you. And that's true of your house or your business or your workplace. Don't just run around and take any old thing. Look for God's best for you. He's prepared a house for you. Some of you are wanting to expand your business or a ministry role. and You need a set of offices. God's got something perfect for you. You don't jump from a tent to a, you know, the Taj Mahal, but you go the next step and say, this is God's provision and it works out well for you. And so all of these things, I want you to hear me today. God's got you covered. God's prepared provision for you before time began. And whether it's, as I prayed before, whether it's a partner in life, God's got them being shaped, getting ready for you. Whether it's a house for you or your family or your business place or, or your church, God has something special for you. It's already prepared. I just believe today the Holy Spirit's stirring people. I've settled for backyard. I've settled for second best. I've let the, the ravens bring roadkill. No, no. According to your faith, be it under you. God has prepared supernatural abundance and overflowing prosperity and blessing in the areas that He's called you to be and minister in. He will provide your every need. It's already locked down in the DNA of this little speck of dust called creation. It's already done with your name on it. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. I'm feeling good today. I'm feeling like people are breathing. You're breathing the air of heaven instead of the dust of defeat. Father, today, let people shake off the dust of defeat. Let them breathe the air of heaven. Let them dare to believe again that you've already prepared not only the way and our steps and all that stuff for us, you've got provision earmarked for us. And oh my, we dare to believe. We dare to believe. We dare to receive in Jesus' Name. Everybody said, be it done unto you in Jesus' Name. Let me pray for people that need to say yes to Jesus. If you're listening, you've been a part of this service and you're not right with God, your heart tells you that. And all you have to do is say yes to Jesus. You're the Son of God. You died for my sins and all who call on your name will be saved. And right now, I want to say, yes, Lord Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me, set me free from sin, break the power of sin, wash me clean and fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live the overcoming life in and through my Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. And amen. Love you. Bless you. Great to have people connecting as outposts of Epic Church in our ministry. We love you for that. God bless you. Have an awesome week in the name of Jesus. Amen.